Veterans of JB coming to you live. I am 100% permanent total Navy Desert Storm veteran. And in today's video, I'm going to give you an example of things that we hear all the time uh, over here at New Life Veterans and also at the regional offices that you're submitting applications to. Today's video is about a veteran that sent in an application about a back injury, okay? And, and the back injury was from a fall off of a truck, maybe in a convoy, um, and he's been hurting ever since. That is on his 21-438. That's the statement and support of claim that you're going to fill out for every disability. So remember what I said. He said he's a veteran. He, he had a back injury, fell off of a truck, and has been hurting ever since. Okay. So we know that there's three elements to a service connection. We know, number one, we got to have a diagnosis. All right. This is Title 38. Number two, we got to show an event in service or complaint in service, same thing. Third, there must be a nexus. This is law. Number one, you gotta have a diagnosis. Number two, you gotta have an event, a service complaint, and you gotta have a nexus, right? Okay, so this paperwork gets sent, faxed over to Janesville, Wisconsin, and they get distributed to your local regional office. So if you're in Atlanta, we got a regional office in Atlanta right across you from the hospital. So let's just fast forward and say the VA rater gets this information and say, okay, let's do a duty to assist. Let's pull his service treatment records, okay? Service treatment records are issued by the DOD, Department of Defense, and we found that he had a single complaint of back in sick call. Just one complaint, not multiple just one complaint. Can anybody tell me, would that warrant um, a qualification or eligibility for a, um, number one, as an event, and does it qualify as a diagnosis? Well, the single complaint in the service treatment records, this is going to satisfy element number two. So we got element number two. So the VA reader said, okay, we got a service complaint. I found that. And then we looked at his exit exam. That was a negative exit exam. So he had the injury. Yeah, we see the proof. And then when we do the exit exam, when he got out, he didn't even complain about his back. So he's also made the statement that's been hurting ever since. It's happened in 1992, the event, and it's been hurting ever since. It's 2022. The only evidence that he sent in was the late, I mean, not the late statement, but the 21-438 and, of course, the 526-EZ. Because this is the scenario, this is an original claim. First time filing. Okay, single complaint, and then his negative exit exam. That's not going to disqualify him because he didn't complain at that particular time. All right, so I want to let you know that. Now, so the VA writer now is going to say, well, does this warrant us to pay QTC VES or LHI to examine this person because we got to have more than just the event. Uh, we got to provide a nexus. He said he said in his statement that it's been hurting ever since. So his current condition is saying that he has a nexus. So that's, let's just give him the benefit of doubt. And then the diagnosis or symptoms, the way the law is written, he definitely halfway got that out the way. But this is what's going to matter. So in other words, he has enough eligibility for the low threshold to trigger a duty to assist to get a medical examiner to do what? Can anybody tell me? What is the purpose of QTC, LHI, and VA, VES? They're been paid billions of dollars to do what? I'll tell you right now, their purpose is to do an exam on that back, all right? And what else? A nexus opinion. The, the VA examiner, the CP exam, the CMP examiner has been to college, licensed by the state to operate medicine laws or to, to administer medicine, usually a nurse nurse practitioner, it could be a nursing assistant, to do an exam of the back and the nexus opinion. Now, this person is not, this veteran was a, let's say he was an AT like me, aviation technician, have nothing to do with medicine whatsoever, 
don't have a license to practice medicine or whatsoever. So the threshold is so low, it's going to trigger a CMP examiner. So if your claims that you're sending into the VA uh, just make a little bit of sense, it, all it's going to do is trigger a CMP exam by QTC, v, VES, who has hired doctors or nurse practitioners or nurses to go and do an examination and to provide a nexus opinion. And I got a question to ask you guys. If you're going into an examination as an avionics technician or are you working as a mail carrier at the post office now, uh, or you may be a truck driver, you may be working in the medical office as an assistant, Do are you educated enough, qualified enough to make the assertion of the opinion that your back condition has everything to do with something in 1992 from 2020. Can you legally stand up in the court of law and make that statement and it be boss? Absolutely not. That person who's qualified enough, who's been looking at backs or looking at the body for all these years to qualify to be a medical examiner for the VA has more qualification, qualification than you. Who's going to have the most amount of weight? You said it right. VES, QTC, LHI going to have all the weight. That opinion is going to go back to the regional office, to the building with all the, the nice building. They're going to log, they're going to have an electronic communication and say, I did the examination. It might be possible that he does have a diagnosis. I'll go ahead and diagnose him because he's not really diagnosed. Yes, he does have a back condition. All right, so element number one is, is met, and I do see in the record that he did complain. So he got a single event, so that qualifies. Now for the nexus opinion. This guy has worked uh, at the uh, U.S. Immigration Service. This guy has worked for um, a wireless phone company. This guy has uh, been homeless. This guy has, uh, let's see what else. This guy has been unemployed for so many years. I don't know what he's been doing. I'm going to make the opinion that there's a lot of years between 1992 and 2020 that could aggravate this back thing. And I'm going to make the opinion, and studies have shown through medical journals that back issues are not that chronic and they can recover over time. And it's been 20 years since his first injury there's no way that this could be from the military. That's what the medical nexus opinion person from QTC, LHI, excuse the phone from ringing. I got to get that, excuse me, let me get off camera. That is what, excuse me, let me get back on camera here. That is what's going to determine the outcome of your claim. Most veterans, that's the reason why 63% of all claims are supplemental, meaning they, they disagree with the decision. And 37% are original claims. There's more claims going in for disagreement of what the decision letter is than it is for original claims. So if that's the case, that would explain why 8 out of 10 veterans that are getting service connected are getting low ball rated as well. So you got a high number of applications going in of just lay statements in, in the 21-438 with no diagnosis and no nexus. And they got the proof. Some of them don't have any proof because they was too uh, gung-ho about the military and their branch of service, the Marine Corps, Navy, whatever, that they never even satisfy the event. So you get a decision letter that says the service treatment records are silent. I thought you said this had something to do with the service. Well, it happened, but it happened off base, and I didn't go to sick call, but I had a police record. Do you have a police record? No. Uh, well, how do we satisfy the event, especially if it's a PTSD information? So you, you had a car accident, um, or you had something that went off in the military, uh, but you don't have, you didn't go to sick call. So you can't verify the event. So what's the next best legal document? Lay statement from friends. Lay statements. Lay statements. Lay statements is something that's a person that's unqualified. Unqualified, not trained for it, which qualifies it is lay. But what makes it so powerful? See, at New Light Veterans, 
We're going to teach you how to combat this nexus opinion with competent medical evidence. What competent medical evidence are we going to require? We're going to require you to go into that CMP examiner with your own nexus opinion from a private doctor who's licensed in that specialty. First of all, if you're having a back injury and we show the event and service, you are, we're going to send you to an orthopedic surgeon. We're not sending you to a nurse practitioner or nurse assistant. You're going to go to an orthopedic surgeon, get it, the MRIs, the x-rays, and provide medical competent evidence of your arthritis or degenerative joint disease, and we're going to provide medical rationale. What is medical rationale? Well, we're going to provide rationale from studies, publications, articles, and experience with other patients that has succumbed to a back injury that was 20 years ago. So we're going to give you that competent medical evidence, and we're going to show you how to have a competent lay statement. What is required to have a competent lay statement? It can't be inconsistent to your 21-438. It has to be congruent, and it also has to be notarized and signed. So we're going to combat the lay statement, right? we also going to combat that negative exit exam. We don't care about that. Then we're going to provide some more competent medical evidence. So once you get your nexus letter in the mail, back from our physicians, you're going to get back into our queue in my calendar, and we're going to submit even more medical evidence. So not only will we provide you with the medical evidence from the nexus doctor, our private doctors, but we're going to go a step further because they're always looking at ways to deny you, and they use previous cases. In all of the claims they go represent in a court of law, they use legal precedents, legal precedents, legal precedents, legal precedents. I don't even know how to spell precedents. Precedents, legal precedents. Okay, so this is law like Shineski versus Shineski versus Allen. This is what we call legal precedents. So once you get back on the phone with me, we're gonna find some legal precedents, at least three court cases that's been recorded in a court of law with a docket number, docket number from an appellate court. If you know anything about the appellate court, they have docket numbers. We're going to provide some legal precedents. So we're going to put some stake on your claim. In other words, we're going to put that secret sauce on the claim because we need some more competent, legal terms, competent, medical evidence we're going to provide three cases on that especially if it's a secondary claim because they don't they are they, what this person know about secondary claim we're going to do that and then we're going to go a, a step further some more competent medical evidence we're going to scour pubmed.gov for anything related to what we're claiming with their back okay Everything, whether it's sciatica, whether it's uh, neuropathy, whatever, we're going to provide that education and competent medical evidence. That's what we do. We came in to win. We came to hit you in the jugular. We didn't, we're not playing because we need the goal. The ultimate goal is tax-free income. Sorry about the pen. We need the tax-free income at a high level because we've been killed uh, by taxes and interest and debt most of our lives. In fact, most of you that started working at an early age, at that W-2 at age 15 did not discriminate on your money. They've been taken out for Medicare, Medicare, and Social Security since you were a minor. We've been paying into this system since we were minors. 15, 16 years old working at McDonald's, and you paying into that system. Go, I was in 1988. I was 15 years old. I was working in a grocery store and I was paying Social Security and Medicare. I've been killed by taxation for over 40 some years. In fact, if you look at it from 15 to 67, how many years is that? That's 52 years. 52 years before you retire and you've been taxed for 52 years. And the reason why you don't have any money because you're paying taxes and you're paying the debt, the interest on the debt and everything else. And all of a sudden you got this opportunity of VA disability and you can get tax-free income for the rest of your life. Because you know the Social Security, average Social Security check is about $1,500 a month 
and the average person with a, v, a 401k balance has 100k in there before taxes and penalties. But how long will you last? Because I think about everybody talking about financial independence or wealth. Wealth is measured in time. And if you have more money, you can last more. Uh, and we're living longer. I like expectancy. So I'm trying to have more money in my latter years. I plan to live till I'm 80 years old. So therefore, we need more income. So the big lesson at hand is that we're going to fight this VA disability thing because we know what's ahead. This thing means a lot. I got to be obsessive about meeting the three elements of service connection. And that's what we do at New Life Veterans. So if you're trying to, to increase your income tax-free, you're trying to get compensated for serving the greatest country in the world, and you're tired, you're getting older. Let's do this thing one time and one time only. Get it right. So if you need a consultation, all I want you to do now is go to newlifeveterans.com and get a free consultation. And we'll get on the phone and talk about the opportunity. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.